These are visualizations of various kinds of primes. And this is the final video in my series on these primes. These primes are found in domains called quadratic integers. And these contain numbers of the form a plus b root d, where a and b are integers, mostly, and d is a fixed integer. And we denote the quadratic integers like this, o root d, where o stands for algebraic integer. The domains where d is positive are called the real quadratic integers, because the square root of a positive integer keeps us within the reals. And then the domains where d is negative are called complex quadratic integers, because we're taking the square root of a negative. And the complex quadratic integers are actually easier to work with. I talked about them in my previous video, where I showed that within each of these complex domains, we can find the primes using a sieve, where we start with all of the numbers, except for zero in the units, and at each step we find the smallest remaining numbers, consider them prime, and then remove their multiples. And by smallest remaining numbers, we mean according to the norm, where the norm of a plus b root d is a squared minus b squared d. When d is negative, the norm describes an ellipse. So to find the smallest remaining numbers, we just slowly increase the size of the ellipse and look for numbers within it. And if we look at the domains colored by the norm, we can see these ellipses show up. Now, in the real quadratic integers, when d is positive, the norm describes a hyperbola. And this has four arms that stretch off into infinity. And so coloring real quadratic integers by norm, we see that hyperbola shape. And this creates a problem for the sieve because the hyperbola goes to infinity. It contains an infinite amount of numbers. So at each step in the sieve, we would have to check an infinite amount of numbers, which we can't do. And it even creates a problem before we start the sieve in the step where we remove the units because every domain of real quadratic integers has an infinite amount of units. For example, in O root 2, 1 plus root 2 is a unit. It has a norm negative 1. And so we'll call it u. u squared is also a unit, and so is u cubed. And in fact, any integer power of u is also a unit, and the norms alternate between negative 1 and 1. And we're claiming these are units because their norm is 1 or negative 1. And we can show that. Suppose we have some number with a norm that's plus or minus 1. We can divide any gamma by that number, because if we multiply on top and bottom by the conjugate of that number, then that bottom distributes to the norm, which is plus or minus 1. So we just get plus or minus gamma times the conjugate. And this is within the domain, so any gamma is divisible by our number, therefore this number is a unit. And so because all of these powers of u have norm plus or minus 1, they're all units. So O root 2, just like all the other real quadratic integers, has infinite units. And this also means that every number has an infinite amount of associates. Every prime has an infinite amount of divisors. Now, this idea of going off to infinity creates some problems when we want to display these. I created this website to display various quadratic integers, and one of the features is a box in the bottom left that gives you the prime factorization of the number. This works for all of the complex quadratic integers, but there are some cases in the reals, like here in root 94, hovering over 2 just gives us a question mark. We don't know what the prime factorization is and some other cases where I give part of the factorization but not the whole thing. And this is because of this issue with infinity. If we specifically calculate for 2, we can find this as its prime factorization, but we don't have the same luck in O root 86. I had a program check a billion values and still wasn't able to find a factor of 2. So unless we're very, very patient, there are some numbers we may just not know the prime factorization of. So I wasn't able to get this feature of displaying the factorization to always work. But in both of these cases, we do know that 2 is composite. We don't show its factors, but we know it's not a prime. And in general, we're able to display everything as either being prime or composite. 
even with this issue of going off to infinity, we can determine what is prime based on the norm. We don't need to do a sieve. There's a shortcut. To determine whether p is a prime, we look at this equation, where some norm on the left is some multiple of p on the right. If this has a solution, then p is not prime in O root d. But if there's no solution, then p is prime in O root d. Let's take a closer look at this. We'll first want to clarify that c is not divisible by p. So we're looking for the left and the right side to be divisible by p, but not by p squared. If there is a solution above, any gamma with a norm of p is a prime in O root d. And that's because if there is a solution, then these two values on the left equal the norm. And using our solution, that equals cp. So p divides the left side. I previously gave this definition of a prime. If pi is a prime, then whenever pi divides alpha beta, then pi divides alpha or beta. P divides the left side, so if P is a prime, it should divide one of those two terms. But it doesn't. For example, if P divides A plus B root D, if that's P times some beta, then the norms of each side should be equivalent. But the norm of P is P squared, and the norm of the left side is CP, where CP isn't divisible by P squared. So the right but not the left is divisible by p squared. We've reached a contradiction. So neither of these two terms are divisible by p, but their product is divisible by p, which means p is not a prime. Since p is not a prime, it's the product of some alpha and beta, which are both not units. And this means we also have equivalents of their norms. And the norm of p is p squared. The norm of alpha and beta have to be greater than 1 because they're not units, which means the norm of alpha and beta both have to be p. And because alpha and beta have a prime norm, they must be prime. Any factorization would involve something with norm 1, which will be a unit. So anything with a norm of p is prime, and we've shown that there does exist at least one number with norm p. For the other case, if there is no solution, then any gamma with a norm of p squared is a prime. Let's assume that gamma is not prime, that it's alpha times beta, both not units. But then using that argument from before, alpha and beta must both have norm p. But that means we'd have a solution to the equation above, and we said that there's no solution. So gamma must be prime. And there is at least one gamma. p is an example of something with prime p squared. OK, so this equation determines what is a prime, but how do we know if it has a solution? We'll look at the first case. If p divides d, then we can just take a as 0 and b as 1, and we get negative d equals cp. And since p divides d, this is true. So we have a solution, which means p is not prime. Now for the other case, if p does not divide d, we can think of this as looking for a norm that's congruent to 0 mod p. And then we can rewrite this and then divide by b squared. And we can replace a over b with some r. So here what we're really looking for is a root of d. Is d a square mod p? So how do we determine that? Previously, I showed this circle for doing multiplication mod 13. For example, if we want to multiply 2 by 3, we stack up those arrows and we get 6. And so we can use this to find all of the squares. We'll start with 1. 1 squared is 1. The arrows don't go anywhere. And then 2 squared takes us to 4, so we mark 4 as a square. And then 4 squared gives us 3, since 16 is 3 mod 13. And we continue this process, finding the squares. And we get to 12, and then we just reach a square we've already found. And then we keep repeating. So at the end here, we see in red, every other number is a square. And so we can think of this, sending some x to x squared is just doubling its distance around the circle. So if we start at k over 12 around the circle, we go to 2k over 12. So all of the even distances are the squares. That's why we see this alternating pattern. And we could do this in general for any prime, but it's not always straightforward to create this circle. But luckily, we have a shortcut. 
If we raise any of these squares to the sixth power, we just get back to one because any distance 2k over 12 takes us 12k over 12 around the circle, which is just k times around, brings us back to one. So any square to the sixth is one. If we take a non-square to the sixth, we get 12. Any odd distance around the circle takes us to 12k plus six over 12, which is just k plus a half. So we end up halfway around the circle at 12. But let's rewrite that as negative one mod 13, because in general, for any mod p, we'll get one and negative one, and then a bunch of alternating squares and non-squares. A square to the power of p minus one over two is one, but a non-square to the power of p minus one over two is negative one. So given some number, we can raise it to p minus one over two, and that tells us if it's a square or not, mod p. So here, for example, is five prime in O root 86? This is the same question as, is 86 a non-square, mod five? So we can raise 86 to the five minus one over two, which is just 86 squared, which is 7,396, and that is one mod five, which means 86 is a square, so no, it's not a non-square. No, five is not prime in O root 86. And here is its prime factorization. It's the product of two primes. And that was pretty straightforward, but we may need more computation. For example, is 101 prime in O root 86? Here, we want to take 86 to the 101 minus 1 over 2, which is 86 to the 50, which is significantly larger than 86 squared. But luckily, we can take a shortcut. We just care about the result mod 101, so we can reduce 86 squared to 23 mod 101. And then instead of repeatedly multiplying by 86, let's just square this. So then we get 86 to the fourth is 529 but then we can reduce that again and then square it again to get 86 to the eighth and then reduce it. And then we repeat to get 86 to the 16th and to the 32nd. And you may see where this is going. What we want is 86 to the 50, but we can convert 50 into base two, which essentially tells us that 50 is 32 plus six plus two. And this means we can take 86 to the 32, the 16 and two and multiply them. So we want 81 times 92 times 23. If we find that product, we get 171,396, which turns out to be negative one mod 101. So this negative one tells us that 86 is a non-square mod 101, which means that 101 is a prime in over 86. And so the shortcut of just squaring and using base two means we don't have to do many multiplications. And in some cases, we can shorten this even further using quadratic reciprocity, but I won't go into that now. To summarize, P is prime in O root D if and only if P does not divide D and D is not a square mod P. But now let's think about this for the case of two. We're saying two is a prime if and only if two does not divide d, so d is odd, and d is not a square mod two. But if d is odd, then it's one mod two, and one is a square, it's one times one. So this implies that two is never prime. But we saw that in the Eisenstein integers, it was a prime. So there must be something wrong with this. And that's because the Eisenstein integers were an exception. Generally, we have a plus b root d, where a and b are integers. But if d is one mod four, we instead take a plus b root d over two. We take all of the halves, where a and b are integers. And here we stipulate that a and b are both odd or both even. So both even gives us all the integers and both odd gives us these odd halves. And this means our norm is divided by four. So when we're looking for this equation to have a solution, we're really looking for a squared minus b squared d to be 4cp. And we recall we wanted c not divisible by p. If p is odd, 
then 4c is also not divisible by p. But if p is 2, we're really looking for some 8 times c. And so the question becomes, is d a non-square mod 8? Now this situation occurs when d is 1 mod 4, and there's two options. Either d is 1 mod 8, which is a square, or d is 5 mod 8, which is a non-square. And this is the case that gives us an exception. If d is 5 mod 8, it's a non-square, and 2 is a prime. And that's why 2 is a prime in the Eisenstein integers, because they are O root negative 3, and negative 3 is 5 mod 8. So our definition of a prime is that p does not divide d, and d is not a square mod p, or p is 2 and d is 5 mod 8. To wrap things up, let's look at the quadratic integers. In my previous video, I covered all of these, the complex quadratic integers. So now let's take a look at the reals. And on my website, I grouped them by their equivalence class mod 8. So first, 1 mod 8. 1 mod 8 is 1 mod 4, so we get the hexagonal display. And they always have these disjointed hexagons. And that's because they always have primes with norm 2, one of which has multiples in these upwards diagonals, and the other has multiples in the downwards diagonals, and this fractures the grid into lonely hexagons. When d is 41, we see these kind of diamond shapes, and that's because there are primes with norm 5 that have multiples on diagonals that are a little further apart. So they further split the lonely hexagons into these diamond collections. And when d is 73, we get these smaller diamonds because there are primes with norm 3 that have a similar effect. Moving on to 2 mod 8, the only quadratic integers where d is 2 mod 8 is O root 2. And here is a zoomed out view of it, and we can kind of see the primes are more dense along these lines that make an x, and that's actually our hyperbola. Those lines have low norms. Next are the primes 3 mod 8, so here is O root 3, and we see this has kind of a checkerboard pattern. We have a prime with norm 2 that has multiples in a checkerboard. So all of those are not prime, the remaining primes form this checkerboard. We also have root 3 as a prime that removes every third column. So the checkerboard is split into this kind of alternating zigzag. 83 seems pretty dense, there are a lot of primes here, and that's because 3, 5, 7, 11, and 13 are all prime. So for each of those, instead of getting two primes to divide the plane, there's only one. So there's not quite so many primes of low norm. Conversely, 139 seems pretty empty. 3 and 5 and 13 are not prime here. Now on to 5 mod 8. We're back to the hexagonal view. And this is the special case where 2 is a prime. So we see the primes are a little more dense because we don't have anything with norm 2, which has the densest multiples. And O root 5 is particularly dense because it has all of these units. The units are clumped very closely together, so it takes a while to get a lot of composite numbers. O root 21 has these kind of flower shapes because the primes norm 4 and norm 3 kind of dissect the grid into these flowers, most of which have some pieces missing, but, but we see a few that have the full 6. On to 6 mod 8, here we have these kind of alternating vertical lines. And that's because we have a prime with norm 2 that has every other column as a multiple, and then another prime with norm 3 that has every third column with a prime as a multiple. So we only get primes in columns that are 1 or 5 mod 6. And we see something similar with all of the other quadratic integers that are 6 mod 8. And finally, 7 mod 8. Here we see all of these little square flowers. And we get these because we have a prime that has norm 2 that gives us a checkerboard, and then two primes that give us diagonal lines going up and down that split everything into these flowers. And here are the rest of the quadratic integers, 7 mod 8. And then we get back to the Gaussian integers, where this series all started. And this is all that I have about the quadratic integers. Uh, if you've made it this far, 
Um, thank you for watching. I had a lot of fun making this series and I hope you enjoyed it. I've got another video coming up in the future that will show a fun result from complex analysis.